Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third week of Trinity Term. My name is Larissa Siddhartha from St. Cross College, and I am your secretary at the Oxford Union. I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Mari Elka Pangestu, World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships. As an Indonesian myself, it is truly a privilege to be hosting you, Dr. Pangestu, as our first Indonesian speaker here at the Oxford Union. So let's start at the very big beginning. You've held a number of impressive achievements, such as receiving the highest public service award, Bintang Mahaputra, given by the president of Indonesia, the Lifetime Achievement and Leadership Award by the World Chinese Enterprise Forum, and the Distinguished Fellow Award from the Eisenhower Fellowship. But before all of these achievements, especially since most of our viewers are currently still trying to figure out or plan out their life journey, I'm interested to know, um, why did you decide to become an economist? Could you share a little bit about the start of your career journey? Yeah, uh, sure, uh, Risa. Uh, good to be with you and good to be with the Oxford Union uh, of Students. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, as you were saying, uh, I was pretty much in the situation that all of you were in. I think when I was in high school, actually, uh, I studied because I studied hard because I thought I was going to go to medical school. Uh, that that was kind of in my head uh, for a long time when I was in high school. And then I, when I uh, entered university in the first year, uh, I was a little bit uh, uncertain, uh, even though I got accepted into medical school. Uh, and I decided to take some uh, science classes, which will prepare me for medical school, but also uh, economics. And that kind of changed my, my life a little bit because I said, okay, forget medicine. <laughs> I'm not dedicated enough uh, to, to, be a, to be a doctor. Then I switched uh, streams to do economics, accounting, and law, actually. And, uh, you, you know, you've heard the term economics is the dismal, dismal science, right? <laughs> uh, because it talks about a resource allocation, efficiency, uh, how you can achieve efficiency and, and equality and all this kind of uh, 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 frame, framing of, of uh, e economics and opportunity costs. So I was doing all that and doing accounting and doing law. And then in my third year, I took a class in development economics. And that's really the switch because the, the professor, he was very passionate about development. Uh, I think he had been in the equivalent of a Peace Corps type of uh, experience before he be came back and became a professor of development economics. So he spoke with a lot of passion about how, you know, the importance of economics for development. And, and I was hooked actually. And, and that's, I think that's the switch uh, that happened in my life. And then from then henceforth, uh, I, I did development economics, both uh, in my master's, in my uh, uh, postgraduate degree, also specializing in a number of other areas of economics. And then I, I actually wanted to join the World Bank because the World Bank was the institution to join if you wanted to do development. But my father said, no, 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 you have to come home. You got to help your own country first before you help other people's countries. So I went home uh, and, and then I had this amazing career, both uh, as an economist, as an academic, uh, doing policy work and then entering government, actually having to do policy uh, and then still ending up in the bank today. So uh, that's really my journey. But I, I would say that third year class I can still remember his name, Professor Clive Edwards. Uh, God bless him. Uh, he really was the one that switched me. So I think it's the power of learning, the power of uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm also a professor. I hope I've had the same influence on my students. So, you know, it's just something that you go through as a student and, and, and you know, learning, learning and, and exposing yourself to as many uh, things as possible, uh, especially if you're still uncertain about uh, what you really uh, are passionate about. Oh, that's so that's such a wonderful thing to hear to hear that you were inspired and um, to, by your by your very own professor and that actually shaped the trajectory of your career, especially since before was so different was medical and law um, mm -hmm. and accounting. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, as I said, you have a lot of achievement right and one of the many achievements was being the first female Indonesian of Chinese descent to hold a government cabinet position in Indonesia as a female. Indonesian of Chinese descent myself, I think this is an incredible um, glass barrier broken. Would you mind explaining a bit the social significance of your position in the context of race relations in Indonesia? 
Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Indonesia, I mean, being of ethnic Chinese, is you are a minority in, in a country. Uh, you know, we are a large country, 200 and, uh, almost 280 million people. And it is also a country whose the, the religion is predominantly uh, Islam. And I also happen to be a Catholic. Uh, so I was, I always say I'm a triple minority. Uh, I'm a woman and I am uh, of uh, Christian, uh, of, I'm Catholic in a country where, where the dominant religion is Islam. And I'm of a Chinese uh, ethnic minority. And you know, Chinese ethnic minority groups have had sort of ups and downs uh, all throughout uh, Indonesia's history. They, they came as immigrants uh, in, into Indonesia basically for economic reasons and then uh, established themselves um, in, in the country a lot of times in the, you know, doing trading and economics. And under colonial times, they were also uh, usually involved with the Dutch uh, doing the, the, the economic side uh, of, of, uh, of, of things. And, uh, and then we had a coup in 1965, a communist Chinese uh, coup. And that uh, led to a lot of um, anti-Chinese uh, laws and regulations, including that Chinese could not, uh, people of ethnic Chinese had to change their name. So my name is Pangestu, my Chinese name is actually Pang. Uh, and also that uh, those of ethnic Chinese origin had to live in cities. They could not be living in, in the rural areas and so on and so forth. And Chinese characters were also banned uh, until democracy actually. So that, that's like uh, over, 30, over 30 years. Um, and, and then things changed very dramatically in 98. Um, and even in 98, uh, there were anti-Chinese riots uh, around the political upheaval uh, that we had. So, you know, it, it's a tumultuous uh, history, if you like. <clears throat> but I think, I, I, think I, I was lucky. I would have never thought that I could ever become a minister uh, in an Indonesian government, given all that. Uh, but things changed uh, in 98 when we had democracy. We had uh, many, many changes. We had a uh, I think the, the the second president after democracy, uh, Gusdur Abdul Rahman Wahid, he eliminated all those, you know, banning of Chinese character, and he even said, "I have Chinese blood in me." And and then Megawati subsequently, uh, even Chinese New Year became a holiday, and there was a citizenship uh, law that was passed subsequently that eliminated a lot of this discrimination. But I think in 2004, when, when uh, the first uh, directly elected president, who was by the president I served under, he made a point uh, to have uh, someone of Chinese ethnic origin in his cabinet. And he chose me. Uh, and, and it's because of merit and because of the field that I was uh, specialized in, which is international trade. And I became the trade minister. So it's a, I think it's a combination that he wanted a representation uh, of ethnic Chinese, uh, but also uh, based on merit. And it, you know, it was um, to me uh, uh, so challenging in the sense that uh, you have to, uh, you know, peop those of you who have been in, you, those of you who have and will be in similar positions, when you are the first of something and you will, many of you will be the first of something in, in one way or another, uh, you kind of have to double proof yourself <laughs> because, you know, everybody's, looking, uh, is she going to make it or not, right? So, uh, and, and I, I, I think, uh, uh, I like to think that, uh, you know, it's not just because, you know, you're, you're chosen because you're representing uh, some minority group, but you also have to have the merit and the performance to show that you can also uh, do that role. Oh, that is, that is actually very interesting. Um, having the, the need to double proof yourself. And I think that happens, as what you said, it happens a lot, right? As a, as a female myself, like I usually tend to have to prove that and work triple um, uh, harder than, um, than, than maybe just to prove that I'm here because, you know, like, because I'm, I'm worth it. Um, but so how did, you, how, did you, how did you go about it? How did, you, how did you balance it? How did you, how did you manage to, you know, like still keep a very sane and straight um, uh, focus and not have that bog you down? Or do you have any other stories of perhaps um, challenges you felt um, being that first female Chinese descent? <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I think I, I have been, uh, I've experienced um, many times being the first of, right? I was the first woman to have a PhD in economics uh, in a, from a foreign university coming back in, to Indonesia in, in the mid 80s. 
And that was already something that I had to deal with. And, and I, I think, uh, uh, you know, when you're the first of something, people are always either suspicious of you or were just wondering who you are, what you are. Uh, so uh, 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 I, I think the first thing to do in, in terms of uh, what, how I have been able to, to manage uh, being the first of something and, and having to deal with very, I guess, challenging circumstances is to reduce people's, uh, I guess, perceptions of you. You know, they, they will have all kinds of perceptions about you. So, uh, uh, you know, listening uh, has been an, listening and observing uh, has been a very important skill that I had to develop. And probably it also helped that, you know, I grew up uh, in, in different parts of the world. So I'm, I'm used to multicultural and multi, multi uh, uh, practices, multi all kinds of things, uh, situation. So normally when you're in a new situation and you have no idea what the, what the norm is, you kind of sit there and listen and observe before you figure out, okay, this is the accepted way of behavior or the accepted way of saying things uh, so that you don't make mistakes that will uh, deepen people's misperception of you, right? And, and be respectful, I guess. If things look strange to you, uh, uh, I, I think one of the lessons I learned was one of my friends told me, uh, when I was saying, oh, it's so difficult. I don't understand where he's coming from. Uh, his background is so different from mine. I have no idea uh, what he's thinking, how he's thinking. And then she turned to me and said, he's, he thinks the same thing about you, you know. He looks at you and he's, he has the same perception as you. And then it kind of clicked in me. Okay, that's, that's very true. So it's up to me, you know, to reach out and, and uh, get the other side, uh, whoever it is that you're trying to, to make feel comfortable with your presence. Uh, to understand you better. And in that process, you also understand them better. So I've, I've gone through a lot of that kind of uh, processes. And, and I think it's the only way uh, if you are the first of something, because uh, you, you know it's not enough just to be able to do the work and perform well and be smart. That's, that's probably uh, the, the minimum prerequisite, but everything else, the soft skills, how you connect with others, how, how they accept you. Because at the end of the day, especially if you're in government, uh, when you're doing something, you can't do it on your, by yourself. You have to get everybody to co collaborate with you or coordinate with you or agree with you. Uh, and even if they don't agree with you, you know, at least uh, you try for them not to torpedo whatever it is that you're doing, right? So you, you have to work at it. And, and I think that's, I hope that's a skill that, that uh, all of you will also learn um, in, in different settings. I really like that. It's reducing that... That, that image and actually opening up yourself as a person and reaching out and uh, okay I really like that thank you thank you for sharing um, and then you said um, since now let's take it a little bit step further right um, then for a decade you were Indonesia's minister of trade and then the minister of tourism and creative economy could you share a little bit about your roles in the Indonesian cabinet looking back um, what do you believe for your most successful achievements well, I think uh, probably people of your generation may have forgotten that we fought, we had to fight for democracy and reforms. So uh, I was part of, you know, pre-98, uh, I was part of the reform movement, right? Uh, we were all about, okay, we need to get uh, the, the corruption and nepotism and collusion policies out of the way. We need to get a democracy. Uh, so we had... We had different uh, reformers uh, who were in, I was in the economic area, there were reformers in the political area, there were reformers from the military. And the, one of the reformers for the military then became the president who I served under. So we were part of this reform movement. So we entered government with a reform agenda, right? Uh, and that was exactly a, a lot of what I did, especially the first five years was about reforms, policy reforms, uh, you know, getting trade policies right, getting investment policies right. And then on, you know, on the finance sector side, uh, Sri Mulyani, who's now also still our finance minister, she was also part of this movement and she was doing uh, all the financial sector, uh, taxation, customs policies, reforms. And uh, we did, we worked hard for the first two or three years and then passed laws and improved uh, uh, implementation on the ground including, you know, one of the things I'm proud of is uh, what I call one-stop service uh, in, in my ministry, you know, getting licenses for imports and exports, which used to be, you know, really rife with rent-seeking. 
you know, okay, you can call it one stop, but behind there, there are like 10 desks. You still have to go to 10 <laughs> desks, right? So we, we reformed all that. And, uh, and, and, and also on the customs and tax side, we did that uh, same thing. And on the investment side. So uh, th those were the things we did in the first uh, five years uh, or so. And, and, and I think the other thing that I was uh, also in charge of was what we call the domestic, the domestic trade side. You know, uh, in, in Indonesia, probably 67, 60 to 70 percent of the of the kind of uh, uh, basic goods purchases uh, happen uh, in, in the traditional market. So I was in charge of revitalizing the traditional markets. And that's something that I'm proud of, because that's that's 13 million or 20, 13 to 15 million people who are working in that sector. And, uh, you know, day to day uh, people are shopping in, in, in those uh, markets. So I, I did a, a kind of a bit of a revolution on, on um, uh, uh, rev, uh, revitalizing the traditional market, uh, including, um, you know, this is a very interesting story. When you go to the market, 90% are women. Uh, and uh, most of the people shopping there are women, but the toilets are actually not designed for women at all. It's still 50-50 and designed, you know, in the same cookie cutter way you would design a market. So we changed all that. Hey guys, it's women uh, who are working here. You know, we designed the toilet so that it's it's uh, more fit for women with the lactation room. Hey, women are bringing their children to the market because no one's taking care of them at home. So we created child mining centers uh, in the market and so on and so forth. So, and then we designed the market, uh, in, you know, with that in mind. And I guess the, the, my, my second job was as tourism and creative economy. And I'd like to think that one of the things that I'm proud of is uh, uh, making sure that tourism and creative economy uh, is a very important economic sector that brings jobs, growth, uh, and very community-based uh, development because you know it's very local. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, you're preserving your natural capital, your cultural capital, and your social capital. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to think that you know we established that, and now uh, I think tourism and creative economy. Of course, COVID has put a bit of a stop to that. Uh, is is in that kind of a, a process, it, it, that kind of framework, uh, and and uh, it is really a very valuable sector uh, for Indonesia moving forward. Yeah. Oh my. I. I okay. I never thought that's very interesting. The, the story of. Um revitalizing the, the traditional market and you know even as simple as realizing that the current infrastructure does not even provide for the people who are actually working there uh, that, that that's something that's and uh, and, that, and by the way it was a good business model because toilets and uh, the toilets were actually business uh, uh, profit centers because oh, people yeah. you know pay a small a fee to go to the toilet to keep it clean right uh, yeah. And so it became a, like a business unit within the market, child minding center, the same thing, you know, and, and it worked well because, the, you know, you're willing to pay a small fee so you can have a clean toilet, a small fee. So someone's uh, taking good care of your child and it became a profit center. <laughs> so it was well, a good business model too. <laughs> well, that, that's very, that, that's hilarious and interesting at the same time. Uh, that's suddenly new income, that's new revenue that wasn't even there before because um, there are probably a lot of uh, men's restroom that were used. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Men weren't even working in the traditional yeah. market. Oh, no, that's 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 interesting. Um, for our for our members, um, uh, feel free to write your questions in our Q and A box, and at the end of the sessions, we'll um, we'll I'll I'll pick a few questions to 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 read it out loud. Um, but. But yeah, so continuing a bit about your role um, when you were a minister of trade, right? Um, so reading, re reading about, um, re reading about, and as you know, like as an economic uh, economic student growing up in the two thousands as well, um, I I remember that you were sometimes criticized by domestic industry groups for supporting trade promotion measures rather than looking to increase protection for domestic producers. How did you seek to balance the need to promote trade um, oriented policies to pursue growth with the desire to support employment domestically? What were the difficulties involved in this trade off? And I think actually this is probably still prevalent even till now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those of you who study economics and study uh, international trade, you will know that 
uh, you know, theoretically and even empirically, trade benefits the country. Uh, you know, uh, uh, opening up trade because of efficiency and allocation of resources benefits the country overall and benefits the world. But uh, within the country, there will be the, the groups that lose and the groups that uh, gain. The, the groups that gain are, of course, the ones who own the, the factors that uh, are efficient and competitive. And the ones who lose are the ones who, um, who are in the, in, the, in the declining sectors. Uh, and and that, that that is proven the theoretically and empirically, and uh, uh, theoretically and uh, less so empirically, uh, it's very simple. The, the gainers should compensate the losers, and then you'd still be ahead. You'd still have net gains of trade. So that, that's the framework, right? But of course, in reality, uh, uh, the, the gainers uh, don't necessarily uh, uh, compensate the losers. Uh, actually, what happens is that it should be the state. The, gain, the, 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 the gainers are taxed and the tax revenue should help uh, the, the, the losers, right? But we all know that uh, that nor doesn't always work. So what's at fault is not the trade liberalization per se, but it's the lack of complementary policies to help those that actually lose out because of the opening up of trade and they have to compete and they lose out uh, and, and their sectors decline and there's unemployment, right? The, the fault is not in the trade liberalization but the lack of, of these uh, policies. So that, that, that's what we are uh, sort of uh, always trying to, to, uh, to, to explain. But the problem is, uh, and, and uh, this is the political economy uh, side of it, uh, the ones who lose shout very loud and get uh, the, the ones who lose also include vested interests. They shout very loud and they also uh, will lobby either the, the, the parliamentary members or ministers or whoever they can lobby. Whereas the gainers uh, tend to be uh, quiet. They don't uh, go in uh, lobby for the same thing. So uh, how do we manage this? Uh, we try very hard to, to have that framing and try to find ways that answer the, the, the sectors that are losing out. So when we are opening up, we figure out, okay, this sector is going to, to have uh, experience comp competition. So we, we ask them, how long does it take you <laughs> to, to get to be more competitive? Two years, three years, five years. So you say, I'm not opening up the sec your sector for competition tomorrow. I'm giving you time to adjust. Okay, and then they'll, they'll tell you, okay, I need three more years or I need five more years. And then of course, three years come along and they say, no, 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 I need another five years. <laughs> so how do you deal with it so that they can't, you know, sort of rene renegade on their promise, right? That you have to be able to say, okay, look, I gave you this adjustment pro uh, uh, program or how do I uh, make you more competitive or whatever, you have to think about it. And it's, it's very imperfect and it's very difficult, but. That's the only way uh, you can uh, deal with it. Um, and, uh, and secondly, uh, then how do I uh, get the ones who benefit to, to speak up <laughs> and, 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 and say, oh, look, I'm benefiting, you know? So uh, that it's not just the, the ones who said that I'm losing out that are shouting. Uh, so you balance it, yeah? And, and I experienced that, uh, especially with uh, our uh, trade agreement with China. Uh, I, I got a lot of uh, flack on that uh, back in 2010, uh, and that's exactly what I did. I went, <laughs> there was so much noise, uh, you know, uh, against uh, opening up to China. How can we compete? We're being uh, hammered with this competition. So I went and found uh, uh, companies as well as uh, actually uh, sub-national uh, governments, you know, Central Java, for instance, who benefited uh, actually from uh, being able to increase their exports to China so that they speak up also. But it's still not perfect. We just have to, we have to uh, continue uh, to show the benefits uh, while recognizing that there are these downside risks and we have to manage these downside risks, both in terms of the programs of compensation or adjustment and also politically and you know, the political economy of it. But uh, you know, uh, to be very frank and candid with you, uh, those of you who will enter into politics and become policymakers, you 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 don't win everything. You know, you at some uh, in some cases you have to just sort of give in for the time being and and let go that you won't open up uh, because there's just too much noise. You you wait for another 
opportunity opportunity to do it when the timing and the condition is better yeah no no but yeah that's 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 true and i think it will it'll always be like that right and um interesting you said so open communication giving time for people to to transition out or to be to be ready for new competitors coming in and yeah. trying to make yeah. sure there's an equal uh, parts of noise the good like, there will always be noise but try to crank up those who benefit because I think naturally um, people speak up more when they, you know, like people speak up more when they're not happy, but when they're happy, sometimes you just don't say it out loud um, and actually trying to be mindful to do that. Okay. The, other, the other thing I learned was never to use the word liberalizing trade or free trade. <laughs> As a trade minister, never use the word liberalizing trade or free trade. <laughs> you are better off saying, okay, I'm going to uh, do this policy because it's going to create jobs. It's going to create growth. <laughs> Never All say right, I'm yeah, liberalizing. Yeah. A free trade is, uh, uh, you know, in the political context, sometimes uh, is, is very, uh, uh, it, it goes against you. You're, you're better, better off saying fair trade rather than free trade. <laughs> So people are allergic to certain words, yes. and it's important to how, how to even how they to have frame a perception. The yeah, they have a perception oh, that yeah. free trade is bad. Free trade is going to kill my sector, my company, you know, my business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then after your role, um, going forward again, after your role in the government, then you assume the role of World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnership in March 2020. And I guess it would be a miss not to bring up the elephant in the room, the current COVID-19 pandemic. You took the position um, when the pandemic began to dominate all policymaking last March. Um, and how, how has a pandemic influenced your role at the World Bank? Uh, obviously, uh, I came in early March and then we went into home-based work two weeks later. So um, most of this uh, one year and a bit that I've been here, I've actually been working from home. And as many other people have been doing the same, uh, including our whole uh, organization. Uh, but yet, uh, I think it's been an amazing uh, experience and, you know, entering into a new job uh, in, a, in the middle of, of a pandemic uh, and having to do the, having to be part of the amazing response that this organization uh, has been doing to help uh, developing countries from the poorest uh, to the middle income and the higher middle income countries. Uh, we have actually done pretty well uh, uh, working from home, coordinating all the different parts of the bank, including on the ground, uh, to deliver uh, the immediate emergency response uh, on the health and uh, economic impact uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and that has been a pretty you know, uh, amazing. Uh, within a few months, I think uh, by April, we had already um, created what we call the multi-programmatic uh, platform, where uh, we can actually, you know, a, a country. There's a sort of a menu-like uh, platform where countries can can choose. Okay, I need um, equipment. I need uh, PPE, PPE. I need this or I need you to strengthen my health system, or I need a social protection uh, uh, cash transfer programs. So we could actually go out uh, and help countries and the platform and, and find the financing that comes uh, with, with, the, with the program. Uh, so I, I'm on the knowledge side uh, of, of, the, of the bank, uh, you know, designing and helping to conceptualize the program. And then the uh, operations side of the bank is the one that delivers on the ground with the financing, but you know we work very well together uh, to design uh, all these responses. So if, first of all, it's saving lives, right? So it's the health and the immediate uh, economic impact, the cash transfer, the food programs. Um, and uh, I think what's good about this platform was that it enabled us to work with other partners, whether it's UNICEF, World Food Program, whoever is on the ground, Red Cross, whoever is on the ground, uh, that can also uh, partner with us and also other uh, donors who want to come in and help the country and of course the government itself and i think what is interesting about this pandemic is that it really needs the whole of society to to be you know countries that have actually involved their communities 
and their uh, NGOs in the delivery of vaccines or in the, in the uh, social programs have actually done better. So we also had programs that worked with communities and CSOs because you are talking about people being locked down, right? So you need help on the ground and who is on the ground? It's the communities uh, that know the best. Who, who are the people needing help? Who are the poorest in their community? So you, it, it, it became like what I would say, not just a whole of government approach, but a whole of society approach, not in all countries, but uh, you know that, that is how we try to approach it. And then the second thing after the immediate health emergency response is saving livelihoods, because it turned out that the, you know, the pandemic is longer than what anybody thought, right? So we are also now in the midst of vaccine um, procurement and uh, deployment in helping countries to, to do uh, vaccination and procuring it. And most importantly, can they actually distribute it uh, in the country? You know, do they have enough health workers? Do they have the infrastructure? Do they have the systems uh, and so on? So we're working on that. So, and then saving livelihoods, which is continuation of the cash transfer program. So uh, economic support, income support for the households, for the firms, uh, so that they can uh, keep their lights on for the firms, right? So there are all these programs that countries have to design. And we have a lot of experience from past crisis that can help uh, design these policies and to be more effective. But frankly speaking, everybody's learning uh, on the ground. And the other benefit, I guess, of the bank is that we can see we can see cross-country experiences across regions to see what worked, what doesn't work, and then inform other countries so that you know we're learning as we're doing because the, the situation uh, is so fluid. So I think it's been a really amazing experience, a huge learning experience, uh, and, and also in a way satisfying that you know we can actually do these things uh, to help uh, those who really need it. Thank you. And I think for that, I can actually ask, there's a question from Daniel Dipper from Modeling College. He asked, what challenges has coronavirus brought to development policy? Uh, you, you mentioned before, like there's a, uh, you have the multi-programmatic platform that you can see what sort of help people are needed, but what challenges um, then with it um, to, to, to move forward? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the main challenge of development is obviously poverty alleviation and, uh, and you know, making sure, you know, our mission is uh, re reducing or eliminating poverty and shared prosperity, uh, because the, the pandemic has had a, uh, an impact, it's uh, an unequal impact, right? Those who have access to digital are in a much better position than those who are not. Uh, and those in the informal sector, the low income households, the moment there's lockdown, they're the ones that uh, uh, lose the most. So uh, I think uh, it has had a huge impact on poverty. For the first time since 98, poverty went up. Uh, and and uh, we are estimating that 150 million people more will enter into extreme poverty uh, by, the, by the end of this year. Uh, and that, that's the $1.90 uh, poverty line. And we, we do see already the impact. The, in, the impact uh, has been unequal. And the impact on women, women have been more impacted by, by the, the COVID-19 uh, than men. Uh, and there will be all, all kinds of uh, unequal impacts, you know, like you take, you can take uh, on, on women, it's because they are, they are the ones that suffer the greatest job losses uh, because they are, they are in the, working in the sectors that are affected by lockdown. They're affected by gender-based violence. Uh, they are also affected by the fact that secondary health services have been declining as everybody's focusing on uh, the, the pandemic. So maternal health care and all that and, and ch children vaccinations are being uh, reduced. And then you have the human capital losses, right? Children not going to school and, and children uh, having to do remote learning. Uh, if you if you are uh, comf have a comfortable home with a laptop that can uh, uh, enable you to do online schooling, you are okay. But what if you don't have any of that? You know, you, you would be ha having maybe one year of not going to school, and the learning losses are huge, and the human capital losses are huge. So the un inequality is going to to widen. So COVID will have an impact on poverty and uh, inequality, and therefore. Uh, policies need to be designed to make sure that you 
you minimize the, these losses and design the policies moving forward in the recovery, how do we regain these losses? And some of them could be irreversible, but how do we make sure that we, we, you know, we have to be aware of it, put it that way, to be able to design and target uh, the policies uh, to ensure that we, we, don't, um, we don't have the development losses. Uh, and then uh, we also need to work on regaining uh, the development losses. Uh, so you said COVID will have impact on poverty and equality. Um, and I think in the past, one of the main ways to develop uh, into a more advanced co economy was through manufacturing. Do you think so this approach is still relevant after COVID? Um, what do you envision now to be the path to economic prosperity and, and shared equality since you did mention about how COVID also impacted women, um, women in the workforce? I think, uh, by and large, the general uh, development policy and which sectors to be, uh, you know, you know, it, it, when you talk about development, uh, I always like to think that it, it shouldn't be a sectoral approach. One should look at the country and see where where are its uh, com comparative or competitive advantages, and then build on those sectors. And 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 it's usually a combination of physical infrastructure, human capital enabling environment, you know, making sure the, the, the policies uh, are there and the institutions are there. So that I think that kind of um, approach is still there. And I just want to add that uh, besides the COVID crisis, we have the climate crisis as well. So now uh, what we are trying to do, what we need to do when we say building back better, we must also then incorporate uh, the, the the, the, how do we do uh, this rebuild back better and go back to the development path, but taking into account uh, the, the, the crisis that from climate change. And uh, I think if you were talking about manufacturing and other sectors, I think, I think what we need to do is to look, uh, if you look at a country, it's about competitiveness. So for manufacturing to be, become more competitive, it is not um, uh, separate from uh, having an efficient uh, services sector, so uh, and modern services sector, you know, like business services, digital services, uh, uh, financial services. These are important parts uh, of, of a competitive economy. So the services that the you know developing uh, an efficient services sector uh, is going to be very important uh, moving forward. And of course, making sure that your your other sector, your agriculture uh, and uh, tourism uh, and and uh, other uh, natural-based sectors are also going to be continuing to be competitive and sustainable, right? Especially with agriculture, food, and land use, and uh, and minerals, and mining, and all that. They they need to they they can still contribute to growth, but they need to do it. You need to do it in a in a very much more uh, sustainable way. So that that's if you take a kind of a sectoral approach. And I do think services sector, including tourism um, and uh, the ability to deliver digital uh, services, di uh, data flows, uh, which is becoming the new, uh, the new uh, frontier uh, of growth and development uh, will be very, very important. And it's been accelerated, I think. Uh, COVID has actually accelerated that process. And so countries that, that, that are able to, to build out their uh, physical, digital connectivity and the ecosystem that supports it are the one that, that can uh, gain uh, from this. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, that's that's true. So there are winners and <laughs> anything, there are winners and losers. And I, yeah, as what you said, um, the winner here, I guess, is with the situations, the data flow becoming the new frontier um, moving forward. And, um, and you mentioned a bit before about climate change. Um, and as you mentioned earlier on, like it seems to disproportionately affect low to middle income countries. How do you, how does the World Bank ensure then that these low to middle income countries are resilient to the effects of climate change, especially given that, um, given the economic constraints facing emerging economies? Uh, what sort of policies can countries have to support climate change efforts without hindering growth? Because there's always that question, right? Growth or caring about the the planet. <laughs> That's exactly where uh, uh, we need to totally change the paradigm. 
it's not a trade-off. Growth and climate are not trade-offs. And this is uh, the approach that we are trying to develop uh, now. Because you know, basically, uh, developing countries are facing this dual crisis of climate and COVID, uh, you know, the economic and social impact of COVID. And they were already facing structural challenges of development before, even before COVID. And COVID has accentuated these development challenges. And on top of that, you have the climate crisis. And the fact that the pandemic itself is a zoonotic disease, that is uh, the migration of the virus from animals uh, to humans. And that has been caused because you know, the urban areas are encroaching into the, into the areas, the conservation areas of where animals live and so on and so forth. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, the socioeconomic uh, impact of COVID has actually compounded the impact of climate uh, as well. So uh, uh, the numbers are, are actually uh, somewhat scary in the sense that uh, a lot of the impact, the impact of climate has been much more uh, worse, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's larger for the more vulnerable and poorer and fragile countries. You know, the ones that are causing the, the climate change are the major uh, middle income countries and the developed countries, but the ones that bear the brunt are the poorest countries. And unaddressed climate change can lead to 130 million more people into extreme poverty by 2030. So that, that, that's what we are facing. And therefore, what we need to do is we need to have a green, resilient and inclusive uh, recovery and growth development paradigm. Uh, what does that mean? It means that you have to address green resilience and inclusiveness simultaneously and systematically, right? So you have uh, to change the development paradigm. Uh, what does green mean? It means investing in natural capital, investing in uh, in 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 uh, in transformations and transitions, whether it's energy, transportation, or agriculture that gives you jobs and growth, but at the same time uh, protects the, the natural capital. Uh, and uh, so you can have both in other words. And then resilience means you have to also invest in risk management systems uh, to uh, uh, anticipate and prepare countries for shocks, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's climate change, whether it's socio socioeconomic shocks. So, you know, like having a good uh, cash transfer system. So when you have a shock, you can uh, quickly deploy uh, the cash transfer and the social uh, protection system to the ones who need it, right? For instance, uh, and for climate, obviously uh, making sure you don't have erosion uh, and, and you, are, you are building, especially for the poorest and fragile countries. How do you build resilience uh, in their um, uh, landscapes to make sure that they don't suffer floods or landslides uh, and, and so on. And then inclusiveness. Inclusiveness means investing in human capital, education, health, and uh, making sure that your policies uh, are focusing on job creation uh, and addressing uh, inequality. So the, these are kind of the elements and they have to be together, right? Integrated. Uh, because people, planet, and the economy are interlinked. Therefore, your policy, your paradigm have to be uh, in integrated. I mean, this is, this is the, the new development paradigm. Um, you can ask me many questions. We are still, you know, there's a lot of questions on how would you actually implement it. Uh, you will need uh, investments. You will need resources. You will need technology. But it, the first uh, important thing is that countries must adopt this, uh, this approach uh, systematically and simultaneously. So uh, I think I, I have provided uh, links uh, to, the, to the paper that we have. And uh, also we, we are developing a climate action plan uh, that integrates climate uh, into development. And we've also given you the, the link. We welcome all your input. You know, we, we, we want to be, uh, this is still, uh, you know, Oxford is a, a premier university. I, you are all great thinkers, and uh, we want we really welcome any any input that you have on on our new development paradigm. Well, it's not really new. It, the new thing about it, you know, we've we've all, always looked at green resiliency and uh, inclusiveness. The new thing is looking at it in an integrated way. 
there's, there's actually that's no, that's very true. That um, a big part of it is changing that mindset, changing that it's you can actually have both, and changing the paradigm, changing the view set of it. Do you have any use case on um, on how like what works, like what works in terms of um, convincing countries and whatnot that this is actually a good thing that they should they should start thinking about being more green minded and such. <laughs> Good question, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, I can say all this, but then I go to the minister or to the president and, and he says, well, that's nice, well, uh, ni well, a nice concept, but I need to create jobs. I need growth and I don't have, my budget is only this much. I have to choose, you know, do I spend it on uh, education or do I spend it on climate, right? We do get these questions. So you do need to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say two things, just because uh, I was quite involved before coming to the bank in, in sort of working in Indonesia, even when I was already, when I was in government and then after leaving government, to, to come up with the storyline, the narrative and the, and the analysis that actually shows you that the business as usual, doing nothing, okay. will achieve you some level of growth for the next five years or so, but then growth starts going down because you've, uh, you have externalities and deterioration of, of your natural capital. And you also, we also have, uh, can show that it affects the health of the people in your country, you know, because of increased pollution and so on. And that the health effects leads to productivity decline. And that's, how, that's why the growth uh, also declines, right? And then we can break it down into which systems actually contribute the most uh, to, the, to the CO2 emission. And uh, in the case of Indonesia, it's uh, forest, uh, fires, peatland, uh, and then uh, energy and transportation uh, and so on. So then you can then say, okay, if you did this, uh, then you would reduce CO2 emission by this much and you would have these outcomes. So we are only at the point where we are, uh, you know, because politicians want to know, uh, how many jobs are created, growth, uh, and, and what's the growth story here? And then you have to come up with the resources. <laughs> uh, uh, the resources that are needed uh, to have the investments that will drive these transformations uh, can only come so much from the government budget. The rest will have to come from, you know, the World Bank uh, and uh, external, what we call external public funding. And that's why the World Bank is um, in has increased its, a commitment to uh, climate financing from 28% uh, to 35% uh, in the next five years, but it's going to have to come from the private sector. So how do you create the right conditions for investments in the private sector is kind of the next challenge. So that, that's kind of the big picture. But the final thing I would say is that as you are doing recovery programs, this is what we're working with many governments and including uh, with uh, the Indonesian government, for instance, let's design recovery programs that achieve all these, uh, that achieve growth, jobs, addressing the, the, um, uh, the, the social uh, needs and achieve climate. So for instance, uh, restore, we are doing this not just in Indonesia, but in a few countries. You restore the mangrove or you restore the coral reef, or I think in Costa Rica, we are also doing some restoration of landscapes. The restoration uh, program is actually quite labor intensive. So you can create cash for work programs. You create a, a program that creates jobs and creates uh, income for people, right? And that's part of the uh, recovery program. But at the same time, because you're improving the mangrove, you're improving the landscape, you're improving the coral reefs, in the medium run, you're gonna help the farmers, the fishermen and the tourism industry to have better uh, landscapes, uh, which will have higher real yields of production and for tourism, you know, much better sustainable uh, uh, tourism location. So you've, and, and then you, uh, mangroves uh, are known to also have, um, I think four times uh, the absor absorption of carbon compared to forests, for instance. So you have uh, the triple benefits. So you can, you, if you have that uh, integration in mind, you can have the triple benefits. That's just an example. And there are many, many, many other examples. And that's how we need to, to move forward. So from the broad 
to the uh, broad concept, to the implementation and to the action. Yeah, and then back to the broad again to make sure it's reshaping the narrative and story yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think of climate change, like carbon carbon emissions, should we look at the consumption or production? Like which, what do you usually look into when you uh, analyze such carbon emission? Is it consumption or production? Or is it both? I think it's both. I think it's the whole... Um, you know, one of the tools for uh, achieving uh, this integrated um, approach is what we call carbon pricing. So uh, getting the prices right, you know, if you're an economist, uh, this is it's always about getting the prices right. Uh, and, and carbon pricing in general is, is what uh, we refer to. So you can influence the production side as well as the consumption side. Uh, with product uh, with carbon pricing, and so carbon, there are all types. There are many uh, tools, if you like, uh, if you under the carbon pricing uh, umbrella. Uh, it, it it is about uh, fuel taxes, commodity taxes, and subsidies. You know, making sure that they are giving the right uh, incentives for uh, you know reducing the uh, the use of uh, high carbon content uh, and and in encouraging the low carbon content. And then you have things like uh, using shadow prices uh, in, in your projects or in your investments uh, to, to make sure that you, you are pricing the carbon. And then you have carbon taxes and then you have emission trading systems. These are all uh, uh, tools and instruments that are being used to influence both the production side and the consumption side. But it does mean that you have to come up with a agreed uh, way to, to measure the carbon. Right. And and the pricing, uh, obviously, uh, at the, I was told that right now in the carbon trading, the carbon is priced too low. I think it's two dollars, whereas the actual price to to have a, a sufficient disincentive is around seventy five dollars. So you have to you have to, you know, because it's, it's about supply and demand and creating the right uh, uh, systems and and institutions, but it's a work in process, put it that way. But that yeah. for any of you uh, studying in this area, I would encourage you to, to get into this area because this is something that hopefully will, will grow and be exponentially in the very near future from the private sector, from the government uh, side as well. Yeah, it's, it's a long way uh, to put into like the equilibrium from $2 reset to $75. Um, but 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 I have positive hopes about it. Um, I think people are now more uh, aware of the impacts of climate change, and hopefully that will also impact policymaking in the future. So, in the light of recent International Mother's Day, let's switch gears a bit to female empowerment. I'm obviously not a mother yet, um, but I'm interested to gauge your thoughts on this. Uh, you have clearly achieved many things and broken many glass ceilings throughout your career. Like, what do you think are the major support systems that contributed to your success? <laughs> uh, first and foremost, uh, having an understanding and supportive partner. <laughs> I think that's the right word for it. <laughs> uh, because otherwise, you know, uh, it's it's one half of the of your family uh, that is that is key, right? And then, you know, uh, I guess we come from um, countries, Asian countries, and I guess there are many countries in the world that are similar. We, we are lucky because we have an extended uh, family uh, system uh, that helps uh, to, to support, uh, support uh, our nuclear family. So I always could rely on my mother when she was still alive, my brother, <laughs> Uh, and uh, my aunties, my uncles, uh, they all used to chip in, you know, especially when I was in government, you know, uh, it was 24 seven job. Uh, and whenever my husband, for one reason or another, couldn't uh, take care of the kids, there is always the uncle, there is always uh, somebody uh, who, will, who would step in. So I think, I think we, and, and uh, I always say the other important, besides family, uh, uh, one important um, support system is the, the parents of your uh, children's friends. They are very important ally for you because they, they are in, they probably interact with your kids, uh, especially if your kids are, you know, playing at their house or whatever. And they tend to, in, t tend to know your kids just as well as you know your kids. And they are your alarm system. 
they will tell you, hey, watch out. Uh, he just broke up with his girlfriend. You better be nice to him when you come home tonight. You know, so I, I, I think, uh, I've, I, I think that we have to rely on the extended support system. Uh, uh, and, and I would say that's uh, the only way I can, I can survive. And uh, I hope that, uh, I hope my kids turned out all right uh, with all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure your kids turn all right. Um, so it's, it's interesting, right? So it's, it, people say it takes a village to, you know, to raise a child, but it also yes. takes a, a village to support, um, I guess, other women to to thrive in their yeah. in their career and life. Um, so last question, and this time we have a question that we ask to all of our speakers. So if you could ball up everything that you've learned um, throughout your life journey into one thing for our members to take away. What would it be? What it, would it be? Uh, let me see. Uh, don't, uh, uh, you have to have confidence to get out of your comfort zone. You know, stretch yourself, challenge yourself, uh, prepare yourself, anticipate opportunities where you can actually uh, stretch yourself, you know, or even be in a situation uh, where you've never been before, because that will, that's the only way you will grow. Because that, that you know, in, in my case, a lot of times it was like by accident, you know, all of a sudden you're in this situation where, you, oh, guys, I have to do this. Uh, and then you just have to do it, right? So uh, have that confidence uh, and, and always, but always, you know, challenge yourself to, to, to be in those situations. And uh, you know what really helps you to, to succeed uh, when you are in those kind of situations is two things. This is, this is also always what I give advice to, networking and mentoring. You know, and networking is about, you know, being part of the Oxford Union is networking, you know, networking uh, in different situations, different uh, types of um, uh, circumstances. And don't just network when you need people network all the time because you never know when you will uh, you will meet them or when you'll uh, meet them again and mentoring it's not just about mentoring nice to have a mentor find a mentor that not just guides you and uh, opens door for you but the ones who will tell you when you're doing something wrong or when you're do going in the wrong direction I really like that um, actually it reminds me so much of a quote that I really like it's actually very worrisome if you don't get feedback or negative feedback anymore because then the person doesn't care about you anymore. Um, and I think it goes with the mentoring part, right? Um, if the mentor is already like, oh, whatever, I, I give up, then you, 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 <laughs> stop, uh, you stop giving advices. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you so much for all that. I'll remember that confidence outside of your convert zone and remember to network um always um and and keep on the mentoring uh, session going on um thank you so much uh ibu mari in indonesian we call uh madam or mrs as ibu thank you so much ibu mari for uh you're taking the time to speak with us today um and unfortunately we have that's the all the time we have um right now because right now ibu mari has kindly agreed to go on a meet and greet session right after this it has been such a fascinating conversation. Uh, we are truly privileged to host you today. Um, so just a reminder to Bumari to go on hop the next uh, meet and meet session. But thank you everyone for joining our session and looking forward to our next one. Thank you everybody and good luck with your studies. And I'm looking uh, for you as the next yes. generation to bring us to a better world and a better future. <laughs> thank you.